This video is brought to you by Raycon. Back in November of 2019, there was a call-out post on Twitter about a new animated movie from Spain called Elcano and Magellan, The First Voyage Around the World. Now, the main reason why folks were outraged about this movie was due to its poster and how it portrayed historical characters. For those who don't know, Magellan led a Spanish expedition to the East Indies back in 1519. But instead of going east, he took his fleet west and traveled across the Pacific Ocean. In the process, by mistake, he landed in the Philippines and was the first European power to discover the people who lived there. Native people. Native people who hadn't discovered guns yet. Cha-ching. It's free real estate. And that brings us back to the poster. Looking at it, you get the impression that the Europeans are the good guys and that the natives are the bad guys. Big smile versus angry face. But it's extra confusing because the poster acknowledges that Lapu Lapu is an important hero to Filipino culture, but they got him standing there like he's the antagonist. That's confusing. I also love how they have the battle at Mactan as a selling point for the movie. Elcano and Magellan. Featuring the battle at Mactan and Dante from the Devil May Cry series. Real talk, I completely understand why people were offended by this. Folks are much more aware nowadays about European powers and how they ravage the world during their days of imperialism. Back in those days, if you were behind on your tech tree and Europe found you, well, you were basically done for. And the Philippines suffered that fate. So to give off the impression on your poster that the natives were the villains and the Europeans were the good guys, well, that's insulting, especially since there's a lot more to the actual story. There were even rumors that Elcano and Magellan would be banned in the Philippines due to the perceived message of the film. But what about the movie itself? Is it as bad as the poster makes it out to be? Or is there more to this than we realize? I'll tell you this though, the companies behind this movie were quick to edit the poster. Uh, uh, this guy, he's the bad guy. N not the native, he's cool. Lapu Lapu is cool. This, this Portuguese guy, he's always been the bad guy. He's the villain. Please go see our movie still. Again, I want to be fair here. You can't judge a movie alone by its poster. Yes, this looks damning and it doesn't inspire much confidence. But let's see if Elcano and Magellan is really as bad as the poster makes it out to be. <laughs> hey guys, real fast. I say the name Lapu Lapu as Lapu Lapu in this video. And I just wanted to give a quick little correction. I said it wrong. I found out afterwards that it is said Lapu Lapu. Just wanted to acknowledge that. I apologize for making that mistake. All right, let's go. Okay, so who's behind the movie? Well, there were two studios involved with the production. I am going to say their names wrong. Dibliotoon Studio and Elcano Dibliotoon AIE. Both are from Spain and primarily create, you guessed it, content for Spanish audiences. So I looked through their previous work and nothing was familiar to me. Like that's not too much of a surprise considering that they make their stuff for Spanish people. Doesn't mean it's inherently bad now. It's just stuff that I've never heard of before. What the hell is mystical? Oh, I'm gonna have to see this one. Now, the director for Elcano was Angel Alonso. Just like the studios, I've never heard of him before. But it looks like this wasn't his first time working with Dibliotune Studio. But yeah, these guys wanted to make a movie about Magellan, cause why not? <laughs> hey. For all I know, Spain is like really pumped about Magellan. Like that is their guy, even though he's Portuguese. <clears throat> Part of me wonders if these guys hope to make a fun adventure history movie, like the good old days. You know, the films and shows that celebrated the daring deeds of historical figures. I mean, just look at Disney and Davy Crockett. But those kinds of movies and shows are from a bygone age. And I think that people nowadays are a lot more 
aware of the entire stories and all of the bad stuff that also happened alongside with it. Which brings us back to Elcano and Magellan. People were upset to see a poster like this, to see it feature the Europeans in a good light when history tells a different story. Like, Magellan owned slaves, he forced natives to convert to Christianity, his sailors burned down homes. So I completely understand why Filipinos in particular were put off by the poster for this film. I mean, look at this. They're making Lapu Lapu look like one of the villains of this story. Uh, apparently, there were demands to ban this movie in the Philippines, but it never went through. But I did find an article that said that the National Historical Commission of the Philippines wants to make their own movie from the perspective of the Filipino natives. Real talk, that sounds awesome. I would love to see a story from the point of view of the tribes. Those guys actually had a cause. They were fighting for their own freedom. That is much more interesting than Magellan's arrival. Again, I don't think this movie was flat out banned in the Philippines, but it was not released there either. I asked my Filipino Twitter followers if they knew anything about the situation, and they said that it's most likely that the distribution for Elcano decided to pull the movie since they were getting bad publicity. Honestly, that makes the most sense. These guys really stirred the hornet's nest with this one. Hey, Filipino people! Remember that one time when Spain arrived in your country and eventually ruled it for 333 years against your will? Well, here's a kid movie about it. Yeah, Spain rules. All right, so what's the movie about? Well, it starts off with a clip that's actually later on in the film, and it looks like it's from The Perfect Storm. Oh no, we've got to get our boat over this wave because our story is epic and we need a reason to make the people in the audience wait and watch the entire film. Please watch us, we're exciting, we're not boring at all. We then go back to the true start, which is in a port in Spain. A port that looks a whole lot like the road to El Dorado, but you know, it's Spain, that's forgivable. I'll tell you what's not forgivable though, how bright the background is. Look at this, it's like, dripping and oozing with light. It's, it's like you're looking into the sun with all of these shots. It's way too bright. We are then introduced to our main characters. You got Elcano here, who, by the way, looks nothing like his actual self from history. Uh, look at this guy. Look at him. He, he looks like an off-brand Flynn Rider from Tangled, down to the color scheme and everything. And, and then we meet Magellan, who... He looks like one of those faces you would see in one of those, like, mobile games. You know what I'm talking about? With the, like, clash of clans? Look, look at his face. And now look at that. Am I the only one here seeing similarities? Oh, whatever. So Magellan is going around town trying to put together a team because he wants to go sail to the East Indies. Elcano is there. He's getting chased down by the Spanish. He's like, oh, I gotta run. I gotta run around town and in the same fashion as the road to El Dorado. And also, uh, Esmeralda is here too, because, you know, why not? And then Elcano goes to Magellan and he's like, hey, can I sign up for this voyage? I got to get the hell out of town. And Magellan's like, bro, I like the cut of your jib. Get on board. We're also introduced to this sharp tooth looking Portuguese villain. And the Portuguese guy is like, you can't sail to the East Islands because those paths belong to the Portuguese. And Magellan's like, well, tough sh brother, we're going west. And you can't do anything about it because you don't own the Western Hemisphere. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, the world's up for grabs. It belongs to anybody now. And, and the Portuguese villain is like, darn it, I need to uh, put a spy on Magellan's ship to sabotage the journey and report in on stuff. And Hugh, you there, little Smeagol looking Spanish guy, get on board, you're my eyes and ears, go sabotage the trip. They can't get to the East Indies by going west. And I'm pretty sure that's not historically accurate. I don't think there was a Portuguese spy on the boat trying to sabotage the journey. Okay, whatever. We jump to Elcano and Magellan and the crew taking off down to South America where they arrive in Rio de Janeiro. While there, you see how this spy guy is trying to 
put some discontent into the minds of the captains because there's five boats in total and each boat has a captain. And the spy is like, Magellan doesn't know what he's doing. He's going to get us killed. And the captains are like, yeah, we're, we're cooler and smarter than this guy. It, it's so weird to see the story take history and like mold it and not really show what was happening because there were mutinies on this voyage. But I don't think some random Portuguese spy guy was the catalyst for it. If anything, maybe the sailors dying from scurvy was the reason. But you can't show that on screen. So Magellan and his other five boats, they run down the coast of South America. There's a mutiny. There's one of the boats gets destroyed. Uh, Magellan's like, we are down to four boats. Oh, wait, we found this strait that cuts through South America at the cape of it. They go through it. They somehow push a boat through a rocky cavern by pushing it through with another boat, which I'm like, that would break both boats. That's a bad idea, but it's cartoon physics. Who cares? And then three of the boats get through because historically speaking, one of the other boats at that point was like, screw this. We're going home, which I think is what happened. I think they gave another boat up and they're like, just let them have it. Whatever. The crew then gets to the Pacific Ocean where they're like, we'll be through this in a couple of days. Spoiler alert, took a couple of months. And I was wondering if they would show this part where, because on the actual voyage, they arrive in Guam and a bunch of drama goes down there, but they, they just skip that. They go right to, and forgive me if I say this wrong, Cebu, C-E-B-U. Cebu. And that's where they meet the natives. And you get the Spaniards arriving on the beach, wearing their fancy armor, being like, ha ha, we are here in the name of the Spanish king. And we want to talk to whoever is in charge here. So Magellan rubs elbows with the local chieftain. And this is where things get really stupid, like really stupid. Introducing chieftain guy who looks a lot like the chief from El Dorado. I had some folks on Twitter tell me that the actual outfits of the natives here in the Philippines looks more like it's from South America and not the actual cultural clothes of the Filipino people. So I, I don't know. I need to actually look that one up but I wouldn't be surprised if that is the case. And then you got this girl character who comes out of nowhere and she's like, I'm the girl character. I will help you translate and be your like assistant. And it's so interesting how she's on the poster and we don't even see her until like the beginning of the third act. It's ridiculous. It, it, it's, it's so dumb how she comes out of nowhere. She like gets angry at Elcano because he's like, oh man, she's, she's hot. And she's like, why I ought to? Well, here, men aren't the only ones who sail the oceans. I'll give you the directions you need. You can find the enemy of my people that way, boy. They go to a feast, and then during the feast, the spy guy runs off to another island where he's like, I'm going to give these natives my underwear to convince them to kill Magellan. And it's like, what? And, and by the way, this is the island that Lapu Lapu lives on. And it's like, are you kidding me? You have him on the poster. But in the actual movie, he doesn't even talk. You don't even say his name. I could have confused him for a background character. So what was the significance of Lapu Lapu? You didn't do anything with them. So Lapu Lapu and his village take the guy's underwear. And then Magellan shows up on the island. A fight happens. Very bad action. Just dumb. Magellan gets killed off screen. Uh, the native girl in a Moana-esque fashion saves the guys and the Spaniards and Elcano. Elcano is like, we got to get the hell out of here. They blow up one of their boats. <laughs> that wasn't historically accurate. And then Elcano and the remaining Spanish people and the native girl go to the East Indies. They arrive, they trade, they get their spices. They then go to dock for supplies and food at a Portuguese port. There's some hijinks that happen. The evil Portuguese villain shows up with his boat. They have a boat fight. They win, the, the Spaniards, and they're like, we did it. They then sail off into a storm. They get through it, and then they arrive back in Spain. And, and that's the movie. Despite having a, a battle and, and maritime crazy adventures, this movie was incredibly boring. So, since I've watched the film, I can finally answer the question. Was this movie historically accurate? No, no it wasn't. They left out a lot of stuff. 
And the things they did include, that actually happened, were told in a very boring way, when in reality, there was much more to it than that. So let me tell you all how it really went down. Let's start with Magellan himself. The guy was Portuguese and was born in 1480. His family was somewhat well off, but homeboy here wanted more. He did a bunch of sailing stuff with the Portuguese Navy and gained a reputation for his ventures. He also busted his leg in the process and got a permanent limp. So at least to the movie's credit, they got that right. Because when you see Magellan walk around in the film, he has a limp. But Magellan, oh no, was starting to fall out of the favor of the King of Portugal, along with the other higher-ups. He was like, hey, guys, listen, commissions are open. I, I want to sail to these islands and get some spices for you. Give me some money. But King Manuel had him blocked on Twitter. Magellan was pissed and instead went to the King of Spain, who was cool with financing Magellan's expedition. Friendship ended with King Manuel. Now King Charles is my best friend. So the King of Spain funded Magellan's expedition west. Like when you look at the world map, the Portuguese controlled the eastern routes to Asia that went around Africa. It's hilarious because Spain and Portugal signed an agreement called the Treaty of Tordesilla, Tor Tordesilla, forgive me, I'm stupid, and this was signed in 1494. And it basically said, okay, here's the line. Portugal, you get the eastern stuff. Spain gets the western stuff. And, and like the rest of the world was left out of the equation. The rest of the world was standing there like, what do we get? But Magellan got his resources and set off with 270 men and five boats in 1519. They went across the Atlantic Ocean and arrived in Rio de Janeiro. They then went south along the coast of the continent, trying to find a way through or around it. Now, I cannot overstate how much of a shit show this expedition was. To be fair, what they were doing was incredibly difficult, and they had very little to go off of. But still, the amount of things that went wrong made this journey come across as a dark comedy. I'll explain. They were lost for months. The weather was terrible during the winter. There was a mutiny led by three ship captains, which temporarily led to Magellan losing control of three of his five ships. Don't worry, he got them back. Oh, wait, never mind. He just lost another one to a storm in South America, which they haven't gone around yet. Oh boy. I do believe the worst is behind us. <laughs> Wrong! So Magellan and his expedition finally found a strait that led them through South America. While going through it, the ship called the San Antonio said, hey, screw this, we're going back home. So now Magellan was down to three ships. By November 1520, Magellan's crew reached the Pacific Ocean, and he was like, oh, thank God, we're almost there. This should only take about, what, three or four days to sail across? <laughs> oh, oh, he was off by quite a bit. It did take three though, but not days. Months, plus 20 days on top of that. And let's just say that these guys were not ready for that long of a voyage. 30 sailors died of starvation along the way. So the morale on the ships were pretty low. But on March 6, 1521, the fleet arrived in Guam, which was both a godsend and a total disaster. Well, a disaster for the natives. So the fleet was able to restock on food and water. But then the native people went on board the boats and started to take items like knives and riggings. In hindsight, it's believed that the natives thought that they were trading supplies, that they were giving food and water to the sailors in exchange for the stuff that they were taking. But the Spanish sailors were like, hey, what the hell? That's our stuff. Um, what do we do about this? Oh, idea. Let's go raid their town, burn down their homes, and take back our stuff. Isn't that great? They were on the verge of death, and the Spaniards are like, uh, no, those things, <laughs> those belong to us, so you're gonna give them back now. After they burned down some innocent people's homes, they left to continue their voyage. And on March 16th, 1521, the remaining fleet finally arrived in the Philippines. Not their final destination, since they wanted the Spice Islands, but you know, close enough. So this is where things get absolutely crazy. Insane drama that was mainly left out of the movie. 
Again, why tell this story if you're not going to include the interesting parts? Okay, so Magellan and his crew arrive in the Philippines, specifically at the island of Cebu. Magellan rolled out of his boat and struck up a friendship with the natives. He was like, hey, yo, guys, ever heard of this one guy called Jesus? It's so strange because Magellan went out for a trading mission, but all of a sudden was like, wait, hold on. I got to convert these guys to Christianity. And I'm sure that the natives were just thrilled about that. Okay, but here is when things just go off the rails. So like I said, Magellan was trying to become friends with the local chiefs and convert them to Christianity. One of the leaders named Raja Humaban was like, oh yeah, dude, I am totally a Christian. You even dipped me in that special holy water stuff, you know, so you know I'm good, bro. Hey, Magellan, come here. Uh, question, can you do me a favor? So you see that island over there? Yeah, there's a guy who lives there named Lapu Lapu. And guess what? He doesn't respect you, bro. He doesn't respect God. So you know what you should do? Take those fancy guns of yours, go show him who's boss. And Magellan was like, yeah, you're right. I should. I got fancy European guns. These guys probably have only spears. I'm gonna go show them what happens when you mess with Europeans and God. They were so serious about this relationship that Magellan and Humabon even had a blood pact. Like, they were that serious. So, let's talk about Lapu Lapu. This absolute Chad. He was one of the rulers of the island of Mactan, and he was not having it with the Spaniards. Spain was like, hey, here's Jesus. And Lapu Lapu was like, um, no, here's a bamboo spear instead. And the other chief I mentioned before, Humaban, was not a fan of Lapu Lapu. And he wanted Magellan to go over there and take care of the guy. It's so funny. This Humaban guy's like, what can I do to use these Europeans to make life easier for me? And Magellan didn't even know that he was being played. It's kind of hilarious, actually. And on April 27th, 1521, Magellan and his men arrived in Mactan and promptly got their asses kicked. Lapu Lapu and his crew saw Magellan and realized that he was the final boss. Like they saw his health bar and they were like, oh, oh, focus fire, kill this guy. He's the one in charge. Ooh. And with a couple of bamboo sticks and Ooh. some poisoned arrows, Ooh. they did Ooh. Magellan in. Homeboy was dead. The rest of Magellan's crew then fell back to Raja Humaban's village. And they were like, oh my God, we, we lost our fight. Uh, we're gonna hang out here for a bit longer. And <laughs> let's just say that these Spaniards weren't the most gracious of guests because they were going around raping the local natives and Humabon wasn't about that. He invited them to a feast. He was like, hey guys, eat up. Uh, definitely make sure you eat your food. By the way, it's poison. And some of the Spanish guys who were left in charge died because of that. At that point, the Spaniards are like, I don't think we're welcomed here and they put Elcano in charge of the remaining forces, and they said, let's get the hell out of Dodge. They had two boats left, they took off, they finally arrived at the Spice Islands, did their trading back and forth, and with the last two boats and crew, they made the decision. Elcano, who's in charge of the Victoria, will go west. He will go through Portuguese water and will try to get back to Spain by going that way. The other boat, the Trinidad, decided to go back through the Pacific, that they would go east and go to, I think it was Panama. But spoiler alert, they got sick along the way. I think they were shipwrecked for a bit. And then they went back to the Spice Islands where the Portuguese were like, haha, found you, you're under arrest. So yeah, more or less, that's the true story of what happened. The Magellan had five boats. He had 270 men. And at the end of the journey, only Elcano and his boat and his 18 sailors came back alive. So it was a complete sh show, absolutely horrible. So many people died. They burned down homes. They killed the natives. They tried to force themselves and their ideologies on the natives. It was just a complete disaster. Now, that being said, Elcano made it around the world. Like he was on a boat that left Spain and went around the world. 
So it wasn't Magellan who was the first man to go around the globe, it was Elcano. But I should make a little disclaimer here, because I discovered that they think the first person to truly go around the world was Magellan's slave. He had a slave named Enrique who went on the voyage. And Enrique here was from, I believe, the East Islands. So he was from that vicinity. And we're not really sure, but technically we think that Enrique, the slave, was the first man to go around the globe because he was born on those islands in that vicinity. And that's where he was left because he didn't go back to Spain. He was like, hey, Magellan's dead. I'm gonna stay here. And yeah, that's the story. That's the history. A lot of interesting drama, bloody, awful things that happened that this movie clearly left out. Can you forgive me? Oh, I suppose so. I mean, Magellan forgave the Land Ho prankster. Land Ho! Where? Where? Psych. Made you look, loser. Good thing there wasn't land or else you'd have to meet the natives with that mustard stain on your shirt. What stain? Ah, uh, All right, so let's go over my five points. First, the story. Like I've been saying over and over and over, the most interesting parts of this tale are the dark moments. Dark moments that were left out of this film. Like they touch lightly on the mutinies. They talk a bit about how people were starving on the boats, how there was a bit of a betrayal on the island, though it wasn't accurate to what actually happened. There's just a bunch of really neat things that make the story interesting that they didn't even address. And I understand why, because it's dark, but at the same time, all the things that were left over, like going across the ocean and arriving in Cebu, well, let's just say those moments make the Spanish look a lot better than they actually were. Oh, we're just trading. We're just sailing through. We accidentally went around the globe and we're just now arriving on this island where we want to make friends. It's like you left out so much stuff and that's insulting. As far as the story goes with like where we begin, where we go, how do the characters grow? Hmm, no, it was bad. I did not like any of the characters, none of them. None of them had any personality that was worth a damn. Elcano was the hot shot crazy boy who really, like I know that he had a character arc where he became more of a leader, but that change wasn't organic. It just kind of happened on the spot. And at that point, the movie was almost over. So it didn't feel satisfying. Magellan himself was boring, reclusive, I'm gonna map up the world and I, it's it, the map is my hat, I guess. I don't even know if that's historically accurate. I severely doubt it was. But even so, Magellan was just this big, loud, I'm Magellan and I'm going to sail across the ocean. Do as I say. That was his character. There was nothing really more to him. There was no kindness. There was no hunger for the unknown and exploring. They gave me nothing to work with. And honestly, that's the case for the rest of the characters. They were one note characters who were boring and offered nothing to the story. It was so incredibly boring. I can't say that enough. This movie was hard to watch. And as far as the climatic part that this poster advertised with the Battle of Mactan, wow, so anticlimactic. Yeah, Magellan died here, but Lapu Lapu, who you advertised on your poster, didn't really do much of anything. I could have confused him for a background character. That's how forgettable he was. So why even bring him up to begin with? Oh, and also the pacing of the movie was way too fast. It's kind of funny because this movie was boring, but there were just moments where it's like, we're here, we're there, cut scene, cut here, cut there, here we go, here we go, constantly talking, always moving. There, there's no moment where we could really breathe and take it all in. It was just things happening, which again, blows my mind because I feel like nothing happened in this film. So to have the pacing be as fast paced as it was, but yet the story and the characters would be as empty as they were, that defies logic. What happened? And of course, as far as being a ripoff to El Dorado, I see it with the character models. I, I get it with the tone of the movie, with them leaving Spain and just the overall sets and everything, and the natives, but it almost seems like they lightly touched on it, but that's about it. I wouldn't say it's a shameless ripoff, but 
definitely inspired. I, I can see moments where it's like, oh, similarities between this film and El Dorado. Next, there's the voice acting. So I found this movie online and I was like, is this the official version? Because the dub is awful. Oh my God, the English dub is terrible. I mean, it's like you have Spanish people with accents and there are moments where they talk and they put inflections on words to have a Spanish accent, but then they completely drop the accent. It's so confusing. Their delivery was dry and stale. Nothing felt organic or natural. It felt like they were reading a script. Like there weren't any performances in this movie with the voice acting where I'm like, wow, I'm really getting a natural character with what they want to say and how to deliver their lines. No, none of them, none of them had good voice acting. It was all bad. After that, there's the dialogue. Ooh, this dialogue was so clunky and awkward. Exchanges between characters that felt like, I don't know, people don't talk this way, especially during the mutiny scene when they're going back and forth. I'm in charge of this ship. What are you doing? Uh, yeah, you're no longer in charge of this ship. I know what I'm doing. Really awkward, almost kind of like at a fifth grade level exchange of dialogue, not natural, to which when you combine it with the voice acting, it's completely terrible to have such bad voice actors delivering such stale and dry dialogue. And once more, the pacing's fast, as I said before. So you've got these characters who are constantly talking with this awkward dialogue and they don't stop. It's overwhelming. It's like, oh my God, can you all please shut up? Can we just get an establishing shot or a sweeping shot where there's no talking? I just need a moment to not hear you all say anything. And it's like, nope, we've got boring characters who need to say stuff with their pseudo accents and their awkward exchanges that don't really sell me on anything. Then there's the editing. There's a lot of camera zooms in this movie, especially at the beginning. Zoom, 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 zoom. And then there are moments where they just cut scenes and just abruptly move on to the next scene. Like, it's so jarring to go from some characters talking on a boat to bam, it's a storm. And I know that there are some films that can pull that off where you cut from one extreme to another, which kind of jumps your system to get ready for the next action sequence. Like, bam, it's hitting you in the face. Here we go. But here, when they do it, it just feels abrupt. Like, what just happened? Where are we? What's going on? Uh, wh who's that? It's confusing and jarring. And in my opinion, very poorly put together. Also, the music was forgettable. I, I did not care for the music. I can't even remember anything about the music. It's that forgettable. And finally, there's the animation. This is the only part of the movie that's any good, or at least adequate, the character designs. When I see them, I think, okay, this works. It's not perfect, but it's stylized. It's got some character to the character. They're not just generic humanoids. They've got extremes about them with their body parts, with their faces, with the shape of their bodies. I think that works. It looks a bit like a video game, but I'll take this over hyperrealism. At least this is kind of cartoony and justifies making an animated movie. Now, that being said, there are some weird physics effects where I see like the stomachs of these characters jiggle nonstop. And there's also other parts of people's bodies who just don't stop jiggling. There's also weird physics with the movement of these characters, where it feels janky, kind of uncanny, the way there's no weight to like jumping or running or action sequences with fighting. I can feel that the physics of the world feel off, like there's no real weight behind them. Again, the animation itself is not downright terrible, but it's noticeably bad at times. But you know, for the most part, competent, so I'll give them that. Oh, and the lighting. Oh my God, the lighting. It is so obnoxious, way too bright, just pouring in, just stealing away your attention where you wanna see characters talking on screen, but you can't really even see them. You're closing your eyes, you're shielding your face from how bright these lights are. Why are the lights so bright? This is way too much. It's oversaturated, obnoxious, ugh. And then when it comes down to like the textures, the particle effects, the water effects, 
not good, like below average. Not the worst thing ever, but not good by any means. And it's kind of upsetting actually, because in a movie that has to do with sailing boats, you would think you would put more time and invest more effort into making your water effects look good. But when I see the water, it looks like jelly. I mean, check that out. Look how gelatinous the water is. Water does not work this way. So yeah, when it comes to the overall animation, the only stuff that seems competent or above average to me were the character designs. And even then, it wasn't like outstanding. But everything else was below average or bad. All right, so how would I improve the movie? Make it an adult series. I'm talking about something on Netflix or HBO or some other streaming site. Make it a full-fledged adult series. Doesn't even have to be animated. Actually, I think it would be better as live action. Find some good actors to play Elcano and Lapu Lapu and Magellan. Really highlight how difficult this journey was, how it pushed the human spirit to the extremes, how there was backstabbing, mutinies, uh, murder, all these awful things that to me don't belong in a kid's film. And if anything, they belong on an adult series where you can take those themes and really do something with it. So yeah, HBO, hit me up. I will pitch to you a Magellan series, 10-parter, 12-parter, 50-parter, and I can get paid $17 million per episode, and I guarantee you it will be the next Game of Thrones, but much better, because guess what? Unlike George R.R. R. Martin, I know how this one ends. <laughs> That's mean. So in conclusion, El Cano and Magellan is a bad movie with an identity problem. Did it want to be for kids? Or did it want to be historically accurate? Or did it want to be both? Because to me, it failed on both fronts. No, don't get me wrong. I understand the magnitude of Magellan's expedition and what it accomplished for humanity. Hell, those guys did something they weren't even expecting to do. And it is important to teach people about that journey. But this movie did a very poor job at that. The marketing gave off the impression that it wanted to recount Magellan's journey in detail. The poster mentioned Lapu Lapu, Juan Sebastian Ocano, the battle at Mactan, events that aren't very well known to most people. So for me, going into this movie, I was like, oh, okay, maybe this film will get into the gritty stuff. Not sure how they're gonna pull that off while also maintaining a child-friendly rating, but you know what? I'll give it a chance. I mean, this movie is an hour and a half long after all, but no. This movie just wanted to use Magellan's story because it knew it was something that was familiar, so it might attract more viewers. I mean, hell, Pocahontas, a film that is riddled with historical inaccuracies, at least acknowledges the aggressive nature of the European settlers, that they were there for land and resources. But here in Magellan, they paint it in a different light. They were like, oh, uh, it was that guy, the, the scrawny guy, the, 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 the spy. He's the reason why the natives attacked us, because he gave them his underwear, and Magellan wasn't trying to convert people to Christianity against their will. That, that never happened. I don't know what you're talking about. And to me, that is the biggest problem of all. By leaving out the offensive stuff, like the killing of the natives and forcing them to convert, well, you're hiding the truth. You're hiding how awful this expedition was to the people of Cebu. And the movie makes the Spaniards look much better and the natives look much worse. That is really messed up. So if you're going to tell this story, then tell it right. And if you're having problems with dark moments, then maybe you should ask yourself, is it a good idea to make a movie about a dark moment in history and present it to children in a movie? Because guess what, folks? <laughs> it wasn't. The most interesting parts about Magellan's expedition are the mature parts. The betrayals, the mutinies, fighting over leadership, disease, starvation, battles, seeing these sailors go to the extreme to survive, and seeing how they react to a foreign culture that doesn't know who they are, one that is apprehensive about them coming to their land, 
and some of them who actually fought back against it. I want to know more about that stuff. Not some stupid cartoony spy character who was made up, not some silly toned action hero Flynn Rider knockoff or boring Magellan ass character. I don't care about those parts. Give me the real stuff. And I know I'm an adult. I know I can request that. But to present this to a child, to give it to a young audience and say, that's what happened, and present it as fact? No, that's not right. That is a disservice. So when you take out all of the dark stuff, which, let's be real here, are the most interesting moments of this story, well, all you're left with is a bunch of bullshit. It's not true. It's bullshit. Hey, has this ever happened to you? Oh no, my headphone cords have gotten in the way yet again. Well, have I got a solution for you, and it's called Raycon earbuds. Real talk, guys, I love these things, and I use them all the time. During chores, while going for walks, while exercising at the gym, like all the time. And it's such a relief that I don't have to worry about headphone cords anymore. My Raycon earbuds are also super stylish, and they fit well in my ears too. They also come with earbud adjustments to get a fit that's perfect for you. There's also a recharging case that's very potent and can get your Raycon earbuds to full power four times over on a single charge. And best of all, Raycons aren't stupid expensive like other brands. They're fairly priced and still have a high level of sound quality. I have their latest model, the Everyday E25s and it's their best version yet. It has six hour playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, a rich bass to the sound, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating feel. There's also new colors to pick from. So click the link in the description down below and use buyraycon.com slash saberspark to get 15% off your order. Again, I legit use these all the time. I love them. I wouldn't be recommending them if I did not believe that. So. Go check them out.